was very much uh, grounded within the counterculture of the 1960s, of which this, this festival is indeed a legacy and an extension historically, and talk to you about some of, I don't really want to talk to you about the similarities because you know that the similarities are. The similarities are mainly cosmetic. And there are some other philosophical similarities which I'll discuss, but one of the things I'd like to talk to you about is some of the differences. In the 1960s, um, the countercultural movement had at its core, we had the music, yes. We had the, the drugs, which was not in all ways a high side of it. There was the music. There was a definite sense of counterculture. There was a definite repudiation of certain values which people deemed to be obsolete and unsustainable. But it bears noting there was also at its core the repudiation of a war and ultimately the ending of a war, which means that the counterculture at that time was making a serious stand against something new on the planet, something horrible on the planet, called American military domination of anything it cared to dominate. And that gave a moral authority to the counterculture of the 1960s. And I would hope that a festival like this does not, and the heart that brings us here, the consciousness that brings us here, I'm reminded of a line in A Course in Miracles where it says, you cannot bring the light to the darkness. You must bring the darkness to the light. Dream and I were having an interesting conversation, and she said, when we were talking, I don't know where Dream is, but we were talking about this festival. She says, well, people just want to be in the light for a few days. But I say to you, as your sister, as your spiritual companion, uh, embedded in the principles of A Course in Miracles in my own uh, spiritual search, but I know that there's only one truth spoken in many different ways, there is a difference between transcendence and denial. And if the consciousness that brings you to a festival like this is one in which we feel as Americans, as men, as women, as citizens of the planet, that we can be here, that this can be anything with true gravitas or moral authority, and we are forgetting the fact that our country has turned into a permanent war machine, then there's something very sad about this festival rather than happy for me. Now, we were talking about, earlier we were talking about the fact that men and the, about the feminine power and the divine feminine. And there was another, I heard someone say that the men here are holding the space for the feminine, which is very beautiful, it's a very beautiful thing, the, the mix of, you know, obviously there are men and women here. And both for the women who want to hold the space for the divine feminine as well as for the men who are holding the space for the divine feminine. Thank you so much. I'd like to talk to you for a moment about the Divine Feminine because the Divine Feminine has a fierce aspect. The Divine Feminine is not just dressing up. The Divine Feminine is not just getting pretty and whatever pretty of the day is, whether it's big boobs or feathers. It's all cosmetic. Hello. The Divine Feminine cares about the fact that 17,000 babies die on this planet every day of hunger. The Divine Feminine cries. The Divine Feminine shrieks when she has to. You know, if you, there is a, an interesting anthropological characteristic of every advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives. And that is the fierce behavior of the adult female of that species when she senses that there is a threat to her cubs. That whether it's the mama bear or the tiger or the lion, do you know that even among the hyenas, the adult female hyenas encircle their babies, encircle the cubs while they're feeding, and will not let the adult males of that species anywhere near the food until the cubs have been fed. Surely the women of America could do better than the hyenas. <laughs> And the fact that collectively, not in terms of our hearts, our hearts are good, and I know that the heart that it draws us to a place like this today is good, but we have to ask ourselves at what point, whether you're in therapy or you're at a festival like this, at what point do you stand in that place which is not comfortable? Do you stand in that place which is not comfortable and not turn away? Because if a countercultural movement such as this at least externally represents here today, 
is one I asked earlier, I said, hmm, is there anything political going on here? And I was told, no, these are just people who are ready to transcend. And let me be very clear once again about that difference between transcendence and denial. Because if the countercultural movement in 2011 is one in which it is deemed for whatever reason acceptable to look away from the fact that tremendous amounts of unnecessary human suffering occur on this planet and in this country for no other reason than that so a relatively few people on this planet and in this country can have all the money they want. That is not service. It is not countercultural. It is the epitome, epitome of being co-opted by the very culture that we seek to counter. Now, you might say to me, well, what do you want us to do? I don't know what you're supposed to do. None of my business what you're supposed to do. But I'm asking you, as Jesus said to the, to the disciples the night before the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, please do not go to sleep. Do not go to sleep in the hour of my agony. Remain awake. That's what they do to you. They put you to sleep. The system would love this festival. The system would love this festival because it's not saying fuck you to anybody. And there's a sense that that is somehow spiritual. There's a sense that that is somehow spiritual. And I, and I believe deeply that as the Course in Miracles says, look at the crucifixion, but do not dwell on it. I'm not saying let's dwell on what's bad, because if you dwell on what's bad, then it's true. That is, you just focus on it and make more of it. But to not look at it at all, to not look at it at all, there's not the divine feminine about that. The divine feminine, if there was a starving child here, Somebody tell me, if there was a child here, or if anyone, God forbid, let, let's just talk about our deep humanity. Let's say right here, right now, God forbid, somebody uh, had a heart attack or something. Well, the fact that I'm speaking up here would be irrelevant. And somebody would yell and say, is there a doctor here? We would all get deeply human very quickly, wouldn't we? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Now, this is an interesting thing about our country. If you look at the, I always say that if I'm, if I'm on an airplane uh, somewhere, anywhere in the world, I love to sit next to an American. I, characterologically, we're cool people, and we care. We're, we're not, you know, we're human beings, and there's a spunkiness, and there's a coolness. But our collective capacity for denial and grandiosity is frightening and perilous.